Okay, thank you very much. I'll start with sharing the screen. I hope you can see the presentation. Okay. Uh, second order of business will be to apologize in advance. I do have some internet connection problems today, and I might be um, uh, uh, unhearable from time to time. So sorry about that. I hope everything goes well. Um, thank you very much for the organizers for allowing me to present in this conference. The question of crisis has been for the last two to three years in the center of my research interests. Um, and it will be hard for me, it was hard for me to choose one topic uh, for this conference instead of just talking about the problem of crisis as such. And I'm, But I'll start from a quite a bold claim. I'm not sure if this claim is correct, and I'm also here to check with you all if this claim is correct, that the notion of crisis remains one of the key concepts for modern philosophy and social sciences that still lacks a definition and still even lacks uh, a philosophical treatise that is devoted or was devoted to crisis entirely. As, as far as I can say, crisis, although has been um, used by many philosophers and social theorists throughout the last well, almost 200 years, it's, uh, there has never been one treatise, one book, one uh, uh, philosophical theory that will be focused on crisis as such, it will give a definition of crisis as such, What I found quite interesting. And I just embarked upon a, a research project that deals with a history of a philosophical notion of crisis. It's not so much what Kozalek did, meaning a history of idea of crisis, but it's an, um, an endeavor to, uh, can I switch it? Yes, I can switch it. Uh, to somehow try to use the history of the notion of crisis to explicate a history of modern philosophy as such, and even the beginning of uh, social and political sciences, which started in almost all cases with an attempt to explicate, explicate social crisis, giving them the name of crisis sometimes, or sometimes using different na uh, names like anomia, for example, in the case of Durkheim. And what I'm deeply interested in is this dialectic, this tension, this logical relation between a subjective aspect of crisis and an objective aspect of crisis, which both have been in the center of modern philosophy, modern theories, cultural theories, social theories, and so on. So meaning on the one hand, you had a literary philosophical descriptions of experience of crisis or theories and political notions of subjective action that leads to crisis or that is called for as a reaction to crisis or something which we could call the subjective aspect of crisis. And there was the objectivist narration about the crisis, meaning uh, an attempt to define crisis as a moment of an objective process, as an aspect of an objective logic. And the way the subjective and objective aspect of crisis, of a subjective and objective understanding of crisis, is something that, uh, once again, I think is extremely important for understanding modern philosophy, as, at least from Kant, if not uh, earlier, and something that we still lack to some extent, and also the fact that we lack this philosophical analysis of the notion of crisis is something that for me as a historian of ideas is extremely interesting, especially that right now we're living in an age of probably the biggest crisis in the history of humanity, meaning the ecological crisis. So uh, I could talk a lot about the history of the notion itself, Maybe I'll just, from, for, for the subject of my presentation today, meaning the, uh, the interwar discussions in European philosophy on the problem of crisis, what is probably um, important to mention is the fact that the history of, of, um, of the notion of crisis from the Renaissance time till the French Revolution is something that Kozalek would call the politicization of crisis, meaning that the term moved from uh, medical um, theories towards the political theories, but also what I would call um, the introduction of the subjective element of crisis, meaning the crisis became a notion that called for a subjective response, a subjective action. 
or even that try to name the subject of crisis, meaning the subject that, that either causes crisis or that should react to a, a crisis. Something that I think is, a, is an important aspect of modern theory and modern culture as such. Uh, the 19th century, what has been already told today by Professor Kopchuk and others, is of course the moment when crisis becomes a key concept, a technical term in, in humanities, in social sciences. Two names that are important in this regard is, of course, Karl Marx and Jakob Buchhardt. And uh, uh, Marx for economic, social, and political theory, and Buchhardt for a theory of history, well, both very important for theory of history, to be, to be honest. And um, they, are, they laid the ground for the discussions on the crisis in the interwar period, which I'm um, interested in especially, uh, and we will move to it right now for the lack of time, um, because the interwar period is the moment when, at least to my mind, the tension and the dialectical relation and the antagonism between the objective notion of crisis and the subjective notion of crisis becomes explosive. What I mean by that is that we see on the other hand a complete objectivization of the concept of crisis, especially in Marxist leaning theories. For example, the Annal School or also the, theor the theories of financial capitalism took the notion of crisis from Marx, which still retains some subjective aspect in it, and turned it into an, um, an, a scientific theory that tried to explain an objective movement, objective logic of the history of capitalism, making crisis an element of this describable, objectively describable uh, process. Um, uh, which is more or less, especially in the case of the analysis of the agrarian economies by Annal School, was the result of a price scissors and a disequilibrium in the supply and demand relations. But this objectivist aspect of crisis is, I think, better described by what uh, Roberto Esposito, quite recently, 2016, called the uh, dispositive of crisis. And this is, I think, one way to describe a specific logic of a uh, concept of crisis that uh, emerged in different places, at different moments in interwar European philosophy, which was, um, to my, at least in my, to my mind, the, the, the most characteristic aspect of this objectivist logic or the objectivist notion of crisis. And I will try to explain that. And then at the end, I will give an example of the other, a radically subjective uh, notion of crisis. And both of them, because they were so extreme, meaning objectivist and subjectivist, without being able to somehow think of the dialectical relation between this objective and subjectivist aspect, fell into uh, conceptual and political problems. One, the objectivist one, was very conservative, was just outright fascist. And this would be, let's say, my political claim, not only philosophical, but political claim, meaning that the concepts of crisis that either tend to be too objectivist or too subjectivist, um, well, they, uh, they, show, they fall shortly of the demands that modernity um, places before us as uh, modern political subjects. So first, the objectivist tradition, which is describable, or the objectivist trend in uh, interwar European philosophy, which is describable by the dispositive of crisis, as Esposito calls it. And the dispositive of crisis operates in a very simple manner. It starts with the diagnosis of a some certain ideal type, essence, or idea. Uh, and then uh, the diagnosis of crisis um, is made by showing that this ideal type, usually located in the past, in the past somehow stopped working or fell into crisis. With, usually they 
don't have a better word for that. They just say this ideal type fell into crisis and the subjective response that is demanded from this very obje objective dis description of a crisis is to um, return to this kind of objective uh, ideal. Some examples, how it worked. Uh, of course, the most famous example would be Husserl, who in his uh, the crisis in European Wissenschaften, the Transcendentale Phenomenologie, diagnosed the crisis of science as a wider radical life crisis of European humanity. Then he proceeded by reconstructing an ideal type of science, an ideal that seems for him, that seemed for him lost when at the time when he was making the diagnosis of crisis. And uh, the, the lectures that Husserl um, provided us with were uh, constructed as a kind of a phenomenological, genealogical work on restoring the true conscious of science and uh, for the European humanity. So we have a diagnosis of crisis, which serves to reconstruct some lost ideal, and then the demand, demand a subjective response, which should have the form of returning or bringing back the lost ideal. A very similar move can we, we can find in Martin Heidegger's writing in his in, uh, 1930s, especially in the Einführung, in the Metaphysik, and his books on Nietzsche, where uh, Heidegger diagnosed a crisis of metaphysics and consequently a crisis as uh, a crisis of philosophy as the thinking of being and called to return to the thinking of being which means of philosophy. And an example from another segment of European philosophy at the time in 1919, Paul Valéry, in his essay on the crisis of thinking and the European spirit, La crise de l'esprit, made a, a similar claim that the spirit that brought Europe to life is now responsible for its crisis. The sources of Europe's, Europe's crisis is not external, but internal. And for Valérie, calls for Europe to rediscover her lost vitality, power, and essence. And what's more, it's quite racist, to be honest, because it also calls for Europe to distinguish itself from an Asian spirit. And the Asian spirit seems to be uh, distingui distinguishable from European spirit precisely through the crisis that Europe is going through. So to uh, sum up, the dispositive of crisis makes crisis into an element of a historical process drive by an ahistorical logic and makes room for a subjective action only in restoring the trans-historical ideal type, essence, and idea. And this was the concept of crisis that was quite prevalent in uh, conservative European theory at that time, like Maria Zambrano, notion of Europe in Ortega y Gasset, a uh, notion of the uh, uh, mass society, and in many other, and of course, Spengler and Zdaniecki and many other uh, names that were already mentioned today. I would claim that there is also a different uh, notion of crisis. Uh, sorry, how much time do I still have? You have about 10 minutes. Perfect, perfect. So um, another uh, notion of crisis that we can find in the interwar period. A uh, radically subjective one, so detached almost completely from this, uh, from any analysis of any kind of a social, historical, objective process, uh, is to be found, to my mind, in Sein und Zeit by Martin Heidegger. And this also be my claim how to distinguish the so called early from the so called late Heidegger, which are both fascists, to be honest, but still there are some differences between one and the other. In Sein und Zeit, a philosophical concept of crisis um, is to be found in his uh, analysis of uh, angst, uh, meaning uh, fear, or maybe not fear, but uh, anxiety, anguish, however you want to translate it. I would just use the German name angst here. So the phenomenology of angst in Sein und Zeit is a kind of, uh, or I would even say the philosophy of crisis in interwar European period, although Heidegger did not use the term crisis in both German or the 
30s. But if we if we go through the phenomenology of angst, I think we can discover some sort of a, a interesting phenomenology of, of crisis, probably one of the first in European philosophy. Angst reveals the subjectivity functions, reveals the subjectivity functions in a web of relations. And the possibilities open in the experience of angst are at the same time the freedom to act and the radical individualization of that freedom. Angst is a crisis of shared and common rules, and experience on and um, is a is a crisis of shared and common rules and an experience and an existential state that forces Dasein to look for rules of common practice or change the functioning of existing rules. Angst is not a possibility of a specific action, but an experience of an impossibility to undertake any action. The impossibility and possibility falls together in this case. In angst, we must, and not only can, act differently. Crisis, therefore, is a mode of being, not of thinking. And the experience of crisis for Heidegger is an experience of an empty possibility to be differently, indistinguishable from a compulsion to be differently. A theory of crisis in Heidegger is a philosophy of a mode of being where the difference between possibility and necessity becomes blurred, if not indistinguishable. An experience of angst, of crisis, is described by Heidegger as a radical individualization, privatization, I would even say, that opens the individuum for, to its fate, a term borrowed from, from Zeinon Zeit in here. The being zum Tode is understood as a sort of emancipation from the modes of mediation and allows a radically individualized Dasein to hear the calling of his consciousness and, which is also there in Dasein, of the leader, the Führer. In his analysis of being zum Tode, meaning of a mode of being that experiences the crisis of the existing modes of mediation, Heidegger uses the term violence, Gewalt, and impotence, Ohnmacht. The experience of crisis, meaning the experience of impossibility to use the existing forms of action, rules, forms, form, forms of life, etc., is experienced as violence and puts the Dasein in a position of someone who needs to act, but feels unable to act. The only way to act in situation of crisis, according to Heidegger, is to hear the mute voice of consciousness. Mute meaning understandable only to the radically individualized Dasein. For Heidegger to act in a situation of crisis is not to create new forms of mediation, but to remain in the crisis as the only authentic possibility of freedom. So to remain in this privatized mode, uh, mute uh, voice of consciousness and the voice of leader. Uh, so the radically individualized silent calling of consciousness opens the possibility also to look for a collective fate. The experience of crisis allows Dasein to look for a collective form of action, not in the structures of Midzain, meaning existing forms of mediating collaboration, but in visions of collective action that should be instantly understandable to the members of the same community. What calls this community to its collective fate is the voice of the leader, and his later writings are going to be exchanged for the uh, voice of the poet, that functions in the same fashion as the silent voice of consciousness. Heidegger's political philosophy of the crisis is a paradoxical imperative, remain in the crisis. So, in, when we juxtapose those two notions of crisis, the one that is described by the dispositive of crisis, so to speak, and the one that we can find in Heidegger, we see a completely two different modes of subjective action in the crisis. One calls for a subjective action that is demanded by an objective logic, and it says, this is the only way you can act to somehow remedy the crisis, to return to the pure previous ideal type that fell into crisis. I know, apologies for that. Uh, I, I said from the beginning that might, there might be some problems. So anyway, I think I can finish here by describing the two radically different notions of crisis, the objectivist one and the radically subjective span, a conservative and a fascist notion of, um, of crisis 
I hope I somehow introduced the problem of the notion of crisis as such and why it remains a very important philosophical problem to analyze today, because we still do not have, even after the post-war discussions by Edgar Morin, Reinhard Kozelek, uh, Massimo Cacciari, Antonio Negri, and many others who took up the problem of crisis, we still, stand, still don't really, to my mind, have a notion of crisis that somehow binds together this objective and subjective one that allows for action in the times of crisis. Thank you very much.